Uh, welcome everyone to your our session today. My name is Krista Carr. I am a middle-aged white woman with short blonde hair and black glasses with gold trim. And I am your host for today's session. And it is my great pleasure as your host to introduce you to the moderator for the session today, uh, which is Dr. Josephine McMurray. Um, Dr. McMurray is an associate professor at the Lazardus School of Business and Economics at Wilfrid Laurier University in the Business, Technology and Management Program. Adjunct associate professor in the Arthur Labatt Family School of Nursing at Western University and associate scientific director at Age Well, Canada's technology and aging network. She is also co-principal investigator on the COG at Work project, which is exploring employer perspectives on workers who are identified with mild cognitive impairment or early onset dementia at work. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Josephine. Thank you so much, Krista, and welcome everybody. We're really excited to bring this workshop to you today. I am a white woman with short brown hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a black turtleneck, and I'm looking directly at the camera. There are books in my background. So before we get started, I'm going to share uh, a slide with you, some slide decks with you. So I'm going to be popping that up on the screen now. So now you should be seeing a, um, a slide deck. So our workshop today is about mild cognitive impairment in the workplace, an introduction to an overlooked and emerging disability. This work would not be possible without our funders and contributors, Age Well, the core research program, a Shirk Connection Grant, the British Columbia Law Institute and the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, the members of our COG at Work advisory panel and all of our research partners and participants. All of our speakers today are people who I've had the pleasure of working with or meeting during the course of our COG at Work research project. Each of them brings a different perspective to the challenges that employers and employees face when workers are identified as having mild cognitive impairment or early onset dementia while they're still working. I will be introducing each of them before they speak. First, you'll hear from a social scientist, Dr. Margaret Oldfield, then a neuroscientist and part of our research team, Dr. Anne-Marie Levy, a worker living with cognitive impairment, Rosemary Leslie, and an abilities manager working for a large Canadian organization, Lindsay Simpson. Our first speaker is Dr. Margaret Oldfield, an independent researcher who focuses on changing workplaces and policy to enable people with chronic illnesses to remain employed. She's currently on the steering committee of the international organization Reimagining Dementia, a partner of the Disability Confidence and Finance Project hosted by CCRW, and a team member on the research project, The Impact of Remote Work on Workplace Accessibility for Persons with Disabilities, hosted by McMaster University. Over to you, Margaret. I'm 69, a white woman with chin length brown and gray hair, a red blouse and red glasses. I'm gonna start by telling you the big picture, talking about the social context of working with dementia and mild cognitive impairment. More and more Canadians 55 and over are staying in the workplace and they're working longer. The graph on the right side of the screen shows that the proportion of Canadians 55 to 69 in the workforce rose sharply between 1996 and 2016 after falling for decades. The proportion of 55 to 64 is were still working grew from 47% to 66% in those years, a substantial increase. So as you see, many people are not retiring at 65. There's no more mandatory retirement in Canada except for certain occupations. And in 2015, one in five Canadians 65 and over were working, that's 20%. When they have a private retirement income, retired Canadians tend to work part-time or are self-employed. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to talk about ageism at work. Ageism assumes that aging should be hidden, for example, by dyeing gray hair or getting cosmetic surgery done. Older adults are presumed to decline, and so their contributions are developed, uh, devalued, and they're eventually considered burdens on society and their families. The graphic on the screen illustrates these ageist assumptions. It shows a fulcrum with a plank over it, tilting downward to the right. On the top of the plank are older adults, progressively deteriorating until the last one is bedridden. Holding up the plank are younger people, some of them healthcare professionals and researchers. The assumption here is that the demands of aging, the aging population on the healthcare system and its associated costs will be shouldered by younger adults paying higher taxes. Ageist beliefs also operate at work. It's assumed that older workers are less productive, they're at increased risk of workplace accident or illness, they're more resistant to change, and they're not worth training. All of these assumptions have been disproved by research. Part of what is seen as ageism may actually be ableism. Next slide, please. Ableism are the structures, attitudes, and behaviors that focus on people's impairments rather than on their abilities. This is one uh, definition of ableism, of course. There are others. In the illustration on the slide, three employees carry briefcases in front of a big arrow pointing to the right. There's a man with white balding hair who's using a cane as he tries to keep up with a younger woman and a man who are running ahead of him. Because dementia is a potential disability, depending on the social and physical environment around the person, people living with the condition may face ableism. So now we have three intersecting oppressions, ageism, ableism, and another one, dementia stigma. This is the extremely negative portrayal, often in the media, of dementia as a tragedy, as a tsunami, um, as a burden for family caregivers. And that perspective of family caregivers is often more frequent in stories in the media about dementia than the perspective of people with the illness itself. It's assumed that people with dementia will continuously and rapidly decline to the point of losing their personhood. This stigma creates harmful stereotypes that for one, create a huge amount of fear of the illness and involve the shunning of people with dementia as they get into the more advanced stages of the disease. Part of dementia stigma is cogniticism. It's a tough word to say, but I find it's a good way of looking at how people with cognitive impairments from any source are devalued. This could be from dementia, from mild cognitive impairment, from developmental disability, or traumatic brain injury or stroke. Next slide, please. These are the sources that I used in my presentation. If you'd like a copy, you can look on the conference website after the conference a week or so, and our slides will be up. Thanks so much. And back to you, Josephine. Terrific. Thank you so much, Margaret. And just a note, I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, we're going to be running through the presentations. Feel free to add your questions to the chat. We'll have some folks who'll be um, gathering your questions and then we'll have an opportunity at the end. Just in the meantime, um, Margaret, um, given the prevalence of ageism and stigma in the workplace, what do you think is the biggest challenge for workers who are diagnosed with a progressive cognitive condition like mild cognitive impairment and, and who wish to continue working? Thanks for that question, Josephine. One of the biggest challenges is disclosure. Cognitive conditions are invisible and intermittent. And disability may only be evident when the performance is affected. So the safety of disclosing an MCI at work depends on relationships with supervisors, with coworkers, the workplace culture, and employer policies in place. One reason to disclose is to ask for accommodations. Another is to get support from coworkers or supervisors. And di disclosure, of course, is more complex than a yes-no decision. There's also everyday disclosure dances. These are improvised on the spot when the person needs to explain, for example, 
why they can't do a task, why they have to go home, why they have to come in late, and often to remind others about the invisible disability that they have, particularly when their coworkers or supervisors change. In my research, I found that partial disclosure was safer for people with invisible conditions. For example, only telling people you trust or people who don't have power over you about your disability or your uh, illness, if, if that's what you choose to disclose. And for example, a coworker rather than a supervisor. Another option is to wait till after probation to not tell the diagnosis, just might uh, what aspects of it might affect their, your performance. In Ontario, at least, you don't have to reveal a diagnosis to request an accommodation. Back to you, Josephine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was a great response. Really appreciate it. Okay, um, so our second speaker is Dr. Anne-Marie Levy, who is a neuroscientist and researcher at Wilfrid Laurier University. She coordinates the Cogget Work Program of Research, exploring the perspectives and needs of employers to better enable them to create accessible workspaces for employees who are developing or have developed uh, mild cognitive impairment or dementia on the job. And so I will turn it over now to and Marie. Thanks for that introduction, Josephine, and for having me here today. So I'm a white woman with shoulder length brown hair, and I'm wearing a beige sweater. So to begin with, I thought it would be helpful to review some concepts related to cognitive impairment in the workplace. So the natural aging process includes changes in our cognitive abilities, and may in fact include some decline, particularly around memory and thinking. Such changes are considered normal, they, it, particularly if they don't impact someone's ability to go about their day-to-day -day activities, like planning their day, going to work, driving, taking medicines, or keeping up with personal care. But when these changes in cognition start to negatively affect people's abilities to engage in any of these activities, it is possible that conditions like mild cognitive impairment or dementia might be impairing their cognition in a way that far exceeds what we would expect to see with normal aging. So let's start with dementia. Dementia is an umbrella term. It describes several diseases that affect the brain, and depending on which part of the brain is affected, the disease takes on a particular set of symptoms. Dementias impair memory and thinking abilities, but they can also include changes in language or navigational skills, numerical skills, problem-solving abilities, and changes in sensory abilities and our moods. And over time, cognitive abilities will continue to decline with dementia. There's no known cure for it, and these changes are irreversible. Next slide, please. Mild cognitive impairment in comparison reflects the state between normal cognition and dementia, and it's characterized by small but noticeable and measurable decline in cognition. These changes are often not so severe as to impact someone's ability to do their day-to-day -day activities, and it's less severe than dementia. The progression of cognitive impairment differs from person to person, um, and in some cases, that decline plateaus, and approximately 5 to 20% of the people with mild cognitive impairment will progress to dementia annually. Next slide, please. The question then is why are we interested in disabilities related to these conditions in the workplace in particular? For one, the earliest signs of mild cognitive impairment or dementia are often detected in the workplace. However, despite the impact cognitive impairment has on your day-to-day -day ability to do your job, these changes often go initially unnoticed, they're ignored, or they're misattributed to declining performance. Next slide, please. So some of the ways these conditions impact an individual's ability to work um, include forgetfulness, they're missing meetings or deadlines, some individuals might exhibit changes in their mood and behavior, um, others are more tired or might, they might have difficulty concentrating, um, and then they might start to make errors or poor judgment calls that really seem out of character for them. Um, what's really important to note here is that no two people will have the same presentation of symptoms and everyone's condition will progress differently. But regardless of this fact, disabilities associated with these two conditions are eligible for accommodation in the workplace. With our COG at Work program of research, we have been conducting literature and policy reviews, as well as case studies with organizations to better understand how employers are responding to what we believe are, is a growing issue as the percentage of older workers increases, as well as the age of eligibility to receive social welfare programs is also increasing. Next slide, please. So our review of the literature indicates that employers feel underprepared and they need better education on disabilities related to mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Uh, it reveals that employers are largely relying on pre-existing technologies to accommodate. 
Um, for example, talk to text programs like Dragon or project management software that supports planning or creating organize, uh, organizing lists for to-dos. Um, those are being repurposed to accommodate disabilities related to cognitive impairment. Um, and also that employers are unaware of any novel technologies designed specifically to support disabilities related to these conditions. <clears throat> On the other hand, employees often find workarounds for their day-to-day -day challenges that they're starting to experience. They delay seeking help. They often find the diagnostic process is quite complex and it's hampered by a lack of awareness of mild cognitive impairment and dementia um, can, and they do affect young adults and middle-aged adults. And as Mark had alluded to, stigma associated with cognitive impairment also discourages employees from seeking help or disclosing related disabilities to managers. And we know based on the literature to date that that is a primary barrier to the accommodation process. So disclosure is affected by all of these well-known factors and more. And our Cognitive Work Program of Research is really aiming to explore novel ways in which we can implement technologies. Um, and in our definition of technology could be anything from education and training to organizational policies, culture change initiatives, or hardware and software solutions. So for example, um, identifying technologies needed to foster culture change, to diminish stigma and create a safe environment that encourages disclosure, whether that's training opportunities, education and awareness campaigns, or new policies. Um, or perhaps what technologies can be used or developed to provide employers with really reliable and accurate data on their employees' performance. So they can be very proactive in identifying when it would be useful to initiate a purposeful and meaningful conversation with their employees. Um, when it would be important to implement accommodations and evaluate the success of these accommodations over time. So improving the availability of such technologies might help avoid common experiences employees who identify with these cognitive impairments have, whereby they voluntarily exit the workforce or they're terminated for declining workplace performance instead. So with our work, we hope to foster a workplace where managers have the organizational support and resources to take a really flexible and creative approach to the accommodation process and where employees can be transparent with their employers about their need for accommodation for mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Thanks so much. So thanks, and we we really appreciate the the fact that you were able to tell us a little bit about what was going on with MCI at work. And I know the research is ongoing; these findings are early, but we really appreciate it. So, why do you think the disabilities related to MCI or dementia are challenging to accommodate in the workplace? Um, there are a lot of things about these conditions that make it challenging. Um, for one, no two cases of mild cognitive impairment dementia will be the same. The age of onset, number of symptoms, type of symptoms, the rate at which each of these symptoms progress or plateau or even continue to decline, it varies person to person, which means people's accommodations in the workplace for those related disabilities require flexibility, will change over time, and they require regular adjustments to remain effective. Um, and a lot of the resources necessary to take that approach are not always available, known, or organizations don't appreciate what has to go into planning for that. Um, what's more, one of the symptoms of progressive cognitive impairment is a loss of awareness of the decline itself. So people may not ask for accommodations that they don't even perceive themselves as needing either. Um, and these are also invisible disabilities that have not received the same level of attention and public awareness that other invisible disabilities, um, such as depression or anxiety disorders have in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and so people's awareness is simply limited, not to their own fault, um, or only informed by personal experiences, which may or may not have been positive. Um, and they might be clouded by stigma that these conditions are ones that only affect older adults, um, and that they're kind of those terminal diagnoses where people can't live well with them. Um, and so these issues pose a barrier to those young and middle-aged adults who are seeking um, a diagnosis or accommodations for disabilities related to cognitive impairments. Um, and it's a barrier to organizations who are not aware of the need to prepare and improve their workspaces um, for employees who develop progressive cognitive impairment while they're on the job. Terrific, thank you so much for explaining that. Uh, we really appreciate it. Okay, so our third speaker is Rosemary Leslie. She's a senior project administrator with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Rosemary has worked with First Nations, consultants, and now the federal government on preventing pollution and protecting the environment. She has many interests, including nature, photography, international development, traveling, art, 
Indigenous issues, science education, and artificial intelligence. Her favorite pastimes are reading, biking, and running. Rosemary will share her journey through her diagnosis and happily her final accommodation. Over to you, Rosemary. Thank you, Josephine. Happy to be here. I'm a Caucasian woman and I have medium length brown hair and glasses. Tuesday, July 19th, 2022, I felt reborn. The stress was just dripping off me and it was over 20 years of stress. As the days went by, I would start to feel more like me than I had in years. I had more energy, I was happy, I was nice to people. I was sleeping through the night. Most of my aches and pains were disappearing and I started to experience a little more clarity in my mind along with the new joie de vivre. Why? I knew what was going on with me, finally. I was starting a new job, one where I knew I would be able to do the work where I knew my supervisor was supportive, where I could learn and make mistakes without me punishing myself all day long and wondering what was wrong with me. A few months earlier, I had been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And up until that time, I hadn't known why for 20 years since a severe heart episode, I'd been unable to work su successfully as an engineer. My life has never been totally about my work, but I spent seven years studying hard to obtain a bachelor and a master's degrees in engineering with the hopes of making a difference in the world by helping the environment. But at my office, I could never understand what my supervisors were asking me. I would spend the hours trying and failing to get some meaning out of spreadsheets of numbers. I would never get more than a satisfactory result in my performance reviews. And then during COVID in 2020 and 2021, I started getting official unsatisfactory results. I tried everything in order to figure out what was wrong. I sought help from my doctors and my psychiatrist. I had changed supervisors. I changed divisions. I changed work topics. Nothing seemed to help. I was trying to figure it out, figure out all this on my own. I did know that communication between my supervisor and me was not good. One reason was because I was afraid to say how I was feeling. I didn't think he would understand. I sought the help of a great service we have in my department called the Respect Bureau which offers conflict management, ombuds, and coaching services. Some of my pain was alleviated by my work with them. They also offered to work with my supervisor and me to increase our understanding of each other, but my supervisor refused to participate. I also thought, thought that some of my brain fog was because of my generalized anxiety disorder. I tried to eat better, exercise more, and meditate more to alleviate the stress in order to be more focused and energetic. But I still wasn't completing my work projects. And eventually, after so many bad reviews, my supervisor spoke to me and said, you need to medically retire or we recommend that you be let go. I felt awful and didn't know who to turn to. I took three months off work. Before that, I had already exhausted my sick leave from all the weird ail ailments that were happening to me, probably due to the great amount of stress. So this time I had to take, to take many days off work without pay. I started to worry about paying bills. However, this break did allow me to sit down and think and really start figuring out what to do. I talked to my family, and although they didn't really understand what I was going through, they supported my choices. Fortunately, a friend suggested I contact my union. I did, and this is when the wheels started turning in my favor, finally. 
It took a long time, but it was my luck that the union rep that I contacted was extremely well-versed in disability issues and saw right away that there were two problems here. On April 28, 2021 at 11 a.m. when my union rep met with my supervisors was when things started to turn around for me. For me. The issues were one, my supervisors needed educating, and two, I needed an assessment to determine why I couldn't function as an engineer. My employers balked at the length of time it would take to get an assessment and then an answer as to what to do with me. In that first meeting together, the union rep was able to diplomatically make my supervisors aware of their responsibility to accommodate me and other people with disabilities that it was going to be an increasing part of their jobs as managers and that it took the time it took. She was also able to extract a promise from them to arrange and pay for a neuropsychological assessment for me. This assessment revealed that I had MCI and was not capable of performing numerical analyses such as those required for engineering tasks. She did say, however, that my speaking, reading, writing, and understanding abilities were fine and even good. She noted that I have a wide range of interests and therefore could do many other kinds of work, different kinds of work. My managers were then expected to find me a new position, which they did. I'm not bitter. My managers got to be managers by passing written and oral tests and have not had the experience and education required to deal with disability issues in the workplace. They and many other public servants I know believe that their role is to produce deliverables and not necessarily to look after the needs of their staff who are doing the work. In addition, I feel there is a lack of structure or process in place to help managers and their employees with disabilities to be able to work to the best of their, their abilities. What I really would have loved would have been to have had an act, uh, advocate that, could, that I could count on to answer my questions and to help guide me to contact the right people and point me to take the appropriate actions. Just making me aware that there were knowledgeable people to talk to who could guide me on what, what to do at the beginning would have saved me a lot of heartache. Having someone at my workplace encouraging me and letting me know that I still belong there would have prevented me from losing so much confidence that I didn't real and so much that I didn't even realize I was sinking into a sort of depression and making things work. Worse. <laughs> thank you, and back to you, Josephine. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your story, Rosemary. It, it's inspiring. Um, I, I wonder if you could think back to the time as you were wanting to be a productive member of your organization, and you were being frustrated. And so, what was the one thing in your journey that you thought that you think was most helpful? for you to do that? And was there anything that presented the greatest barrier to you actually being productive? Oh, um, I thought the question was going to be something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so so I, I, yeah. perhaps we could just, you know, you mentioned the fact that these having some sort of navigator might have been useful to you. I wonder if you yeah. could just elaborate a bit on that. Um, yeah, that, that would have been totally um, a game changer because yeah. um, I could have gone to them early in the process and not having to worry if I knew that there was someone that dealt with people who were experiencing problems I uh, before even before I started working like just when I started working there I would have had them in my mind and thought that someone here's someone who's uh, nonpartisan, so to speak that I could talk to and wasn't one of my uh, managers or someone who may be hiring me in the future uh they wouldn't I would they wouldn't disclose that I 
was concerned about this or that I thought I had a cognitive impairment, um, that would be really helpful to, um, to have someone like that. And I found that the I, I was able to get that through the union, but that was really at the end. That was when I almost mm. got fired. Um, so it would have been nice to have someone before that. But the good thing about the union was that they, other than my, um, my doctor and my psychiatrist, they didn't really understand what it was like, what it's like in the workplace, whereas the union person had both sides to view from and she was able to put the two and two together to see what really needed to happen that I needed to have an assessment first of all and that I needed to be accommodated second whereas um, the medical field as such doesn't really know about that or understand that so doesn't understand that the what happens in the workplace yeah yeah Awesome. Well, thank you so much and stay with us. There'll probably be some questions at the end, but uh, we'll go on to our next presenter. So I am going to share our screen with you again. Our last speaker for the day is Lindsay Simpson. Lindsay is joining us from Alberta Health Services or AHS, the first province-wide fully integrated health system in Canada. They have more than 110,000 employees. She is the Director of Ability Management and Human Resources, where she leads a team of 80 disability management professionals. This team supports the AHS workforce when they're unable to perform their regular job duties due to a non-work-related illness or injury. She's been with AHS for the past 15 years and prior to that worked in the Saskatchewan healthcare system, teaching patient handling and ergonomics. Lindsay has a kinesiology degree from the University of Saskatchewan and is a chartered professional in human resources, a Canadian registered safety professional and a certified health and safety consultant. I'll uh, turn it over to you, Lindsay, and I'm going to shop, stop sharing the screen just as, as you come in so that uh, we can see you. Wonderful. There we go. It just took a minute. Good afternoon, and thank you, Josephine, for that absolutely wonderful introduction. I am a white woman with blonde hair and wearing a brown blazer. Did you know? One in three Albertans are either living with dementia or have experience caring for someone with dementia, and many are in the workforce. In 2021, more than 50,000 Albertans were living with dementia. This number is expected to double by 2030, and with the workforce aging and people working longer, it is extremely important that employers take action now to support their employees to stay in the workplace as long as they are able. In Alberta, the Human Rights Act states that no employer shall refuse to employ or refuse to continue to employ any person or discriminate against any person with regard to employment or any term or condition of employment based on what are called the protected grounds of race, religious belief, color, gender, gender identity, gender expression, physical disability, mental disability, age, ancestry, place of origin, marital status, source of income, family status, or sexual orientation. In my organization, Alberta Health Services, we strive to create, build, and sustain inclusive workplaces for our people. We should all feel that we belong in the workplace. This includes people with disabilities. The term non-apparent disability refers to disabilities that are often not obvious to onlookers, such as chronic illnesses, mental health conditions, learning challenges, as well as mild cognitive impairment. A person living with a non-apparent disability may have mild to severe restrictions and limitations in the workplace. AHS values the contributions of a diverse workforce and individual ability. When an employee demonstrates they have a protected ground, AHS recognizes our legal duty to accommodate the employee's needs in the workplace. For us, accommodation is about designing the workplace to be inclusive and to facilitate the participation of employees and prospective employees in the workplace. The accommodation process requires the employer, the employee, and where applicable, the union or other designated representative are actively working together to find solutions. 
Because every person's needs are different, we assess each situation on a case-by-case -case basis. Once it has been established that an employee requires an accommodation, employers are obligated to make reasonable efforts to accommodate the employee to the point of what is called undue hardship. Undue hardship means an occurrence in which an employer is unable to accommodate as it would create onerous conditions for that employer as an organization. Undue hardship is determined by reviewing financial costs, size and resources, disruption of operations, and substantial interference with the rights of other individuals or groups, interchangeability of workforce and facilities, and health and safety concerns. For employers, this can be a challenge. There are so many considerations to balance while still meeting operational needs. The span of control is another factor where managers may have hundreds of staff reporting to them and are unable to identify a change or a decline in that employee's behavior or performance. In addition, now with so many staff working from home, it is easy to feel disconnected from each other and really feel like you do not know how one another is truly doing. The sort of reasonable accommodations we consider include modification to work schedule, job tasks, training, orientation, equipment, and use of assistive devices. It might also include a change in bargaining unit, a promotion, a demotion, increase or decrease in hours worked. Successful accommodations are part skill, knowledge and experience in understanding the work obligations, but also part art by finding creative solutions to meet the employee's functional restrictions and limitations. The COVID pandemic experience has enabled this for us in healthcare, with more positions being created, such as door screeners or contact tracers, which has allowed us to place more, many more individuals while still meeting their needs. I have covered employers' legal obligations to accommodate workers with disabilities, but now I'd like to focus on this being really a values-based discussion. We believe it is simply the right thing to do. Chances are that dementia will touch all of us at some point in our careers, either through our own diagnosis or in caring for a loved one. We all want to know that we will be taken care of no matter what the future may bring. For any employees here who may be struggling at work, I would encourage you to talk to your employer about resources and benefits that you may have available. This does not mean you have to share a lot of personal information, including your diagnosis, as often the employer is not privy to your diagnosis, but only to restrictions and limitations and your prognosis for return to work. If you and your treatment provider or doctor feel you require support to remain at work, please request an accommodation and work together with your manager, union, and HR. For any employers in the room today, my call to action is this. Lead with care and compassion and be curious. Take time to know staff and how they are doing. Reflect as an organization, would you identify yourself as an inclusive employer? including for individuals living with non-apparent disabilities like mild cognitive impairment. If this topic is new for you, please take time to educate yourself and others, particularly your frontline managers, to understand the signs of MCI and think about whether further training may be required. And finally, review your policies and accommodation process. Think about ways you may access support easier in a confidential and respectful manner and find opportunities to receive feedback to continually improve the experience of your people. Oh, thank you so much. Again, a really inspiring um, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. So Lindsay, um, from your perspective then, as an employer, um, an employer's representative, what do you think the biggest challenges are for employers when accommodating a progressive disease like mild cognitive impairment? Thanks, Josephine. I think one of the biggest challenges an employer often faces with this scenario is similar to Rosemary's story, that many people go undiagnosed for a long period of time. Early on, people with mild cognitive impairment may function well in activities of daily living. However, it is their performance at work that may be the first noticeable flag that something has changed. To ensure staff are supported appropriately, their leader not only needs to be aware of the signs to look for, but also know what their normal or typical behavior and performance is. 
As well as in industries such as healthcare, there is a lot of turnover in leadership positions, which impacts creating and sustaining those trusting relationships as well. Observed cognitive declines related to day-to-day -day memory, attention to detail, judgment, decision-making should all be flags for a leader. I think too often they're written off as performance issues and not re reviewed or investigated in the way that they need to that comes from a place of caring and compassion. No doubt, they are sensitive and challenging conversations to have, but so critical. Early identification and diagnosis of an MCI can improve the effectiveness of treatment and improve outcomes. I think training for leaders is crucial to know the signs to look for, but also what to do when they're observed. Ensuring the employee has access to appropriate cognitive assessments early can help gain precious time and prevent an employee from having a poor experience in the workplace. I think the aging workforce has a ton of wealth, knowledge and experience to share. And with a reasonable accommodation, they can sustain their employment and have great success in providing meaningful work. That's, um, that's a terrific answer. Thank you so much.